Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this forum event on philosophy and Nazism. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Joseph Cohen, uh, who's lecturer in continental philosophy at the University of Dublin. Uh, We also have Simona Forti, uh, Forti, who's uh, professor of philosophy at the University of Piedmont and also visiting professor of philosophy at the New School uh, in New York. And lastly, we have Brian Klug, who is Senior Research Fellow in Philosophy at Oxford University. Uh, Just to give you a sort of sense of the format of our discussion, we're first going to talk about the general relationship between philosophy and politics, whether philosophy is in itself political or whether it can be isolated from politics. And then we're going to zoom in on the relationship between philosophy and Nazism, And we're going to conclude with perhaps some more positive suggestions on how philosophical thinking might help us to overcome the nature of evil uh, and also some reflections on the nature of evil itself. Um, If I can kick off uh, by asking Brian then just to comment very generally on the relationship between philosophy and politics. Let me first make sure that everyone can hear me. Yes? Good, because my voice is a bit hoarse. Not very well. well. If you speak as close as possible to the mic. Is that better? Okay. Um, So the question is, what is the relationship between philosophy and politics? And if I seem... Breathless, it's because I feel a bit like a contestant in the BBC panel game, Just a Minute, where you get 60 seconds to speak on a given topic. Peter is kinder than Nicholas Parsons. He has given us five minutes. And after negotiation upstairs before this event, we've extended that slightly, so I don't have to sound like an express train, which I otherwise would have done. Because even five minutes is not much in which to say something about the relationship between philosophy and politics. I shall approach this topic via two questions. What is philosophy and what is politics? And you would expect nothing less from a philosopher, though I'm not sure that I am a philosopher exactly, not compared with the person whom I think of as the real McCoy, Socrates. Socrates, star of the dialogues written by Plato, I start from the premise that philosophy is as Socrates does. Specifically, philosophy is what Socrates defends in the Apology, where he is on trial for his life. So philosophy is on trial in the Apology, philosophy and, as we shall see, its relationship to politics. Socrates was accused on two counts, corrupting the minds of the young and not respecting the gods of the city, the polis, from which we get the word political. Note that phrase, of the city, the gods of the city. In ancient Greece, the welfare of the city was bound up with the gods of the city. Not respecting the gods, like corrupting the minds of the young, was seen by Athens as an injury to the polis, to the city or the state itself. So ultimately, the charges against Socrates were political. In short, he was accused of being, precisely as a philosopher, an enemy of the people. In his defense, he portrays himself as the very opposite, a benefactor of the people. Though he chooses an odd image to express this, a gadfly landing on a horse. And I quote the famous passage from the Apology, You'll appreciate, of course, that although the work is called The Apology, Socrates doesn't say he's sorry. It's a transliteration or translation, sort of, from the Greek apologia, which really means a defense speech. 
So here's the famous passage of the gadfly from the Apology. Though it seems an absurd thing to say, this is Socrates speaking, I was attached to the city by the god as if upon a great and noble horse, which, because of its bulk, was sluggish and needed to be woken up by a kind of gadfly. It seems to me that the god has attached me to the city just so, to be someone of this sort. I awaken and stir up and reproach each and every one of you, and I never stop landing the whole day everywhere. Now, note that phrase, each and every one of you. As a philosopher, he does not address them as a collective. He singles them out individually. And what's political about that, you might ask? Everything is the answer, or the answer that Socrates gives to Callicles in another dialogue, the Gorgias, where he says, and I quote, I think I am one of a few Athenians, so as not to say the only one, who attempts the true art of politics, and the only one at this time who attends to ta politica, the political things, or the business of the city, of the polis. This is as much to say that each time he singles someone out, he's practicing the true art of politics. But why politics? Because no city is a single entity. Athens, like an enormous pantomime horse, was made up of many citizens. So in the very process of singling them out, waking them up one by one with his biting questions as a gadfly, Socrates awakens that great and noble horse, the city of Athens, which is asleep on its hooves. Asleep to what? To what he calls the most important things, good and bad, right and wrong, the nature of justice, courage, love, and so on. Not that the city minds neglecting the most important things. On the contrary, as Socrates observes, the citizens are liable to resent him, turning on him for disturbing them when they might sleep on, not just the whole day, but, as he puts it, for the rest of life. And, of course, they do turn on him, finding him guilty as charged and condemning him to death. They turn, in other words, on philosophy, rather than examine themselves. But such a life, says Socrates, the unexamined life, and I quote him, is no life for a human being. That is to say, it is not a wholly human life. It's not life as a human being. Thus, neglecting the things that matter most, the citizens neglect themselves, which means the city neglects itself. Socrates sets out to disturb the sleep of Athens since not to be awake, in Socrates' sense, is not to be alive. Not to be awake, meaning not to be awake or not to be alive to the things that matter most and to the fact that one tends to neglect them. And it's not just Athens. It's any state or polis, ours, for example. Socrates' defense of himself, of philosophy, implies that there is a universal need for the wake-up call of the gadfly. This in turn means, on the one hand, that philosophy is always called for, and on the other hand, that there, always something, that there is always something, some condition that calls for it, a deep-seated lethargy, a state of distraction or somnolence of which we are not aware. Call it the human condition. Philosophy aims at waking us up to this condition, to the fact that we are not awake to the things that matter most. It is as if the city as a whole needs each of its members to be singled out this way. And this is how philosophy, as practiced by Socrates, is political. Now, at this point, I seem to hear a voice in the room. That's all very well, says the voice, but you assume the best. You take it for granted that the action of philosophy is benign. The voice has a point, and it continues. As Franz Fanon points out in Black Skin, White Masks, and this is a quote, if philosophy and intelligence are invoked to proclaim equality, they have also been employed to justify extermination. I take the point, which isn't difficult, as the voice in the room is actually mine. But what is philosophy? Fanon speaks of philosophy as an academic discipline, and what he says is true. It is true of any academic discipline. All disciplines bend both ways. But Socrates is no academic. Never does he appear in a seminar room giving a paper, 
nor in a study, writing one, nor in a lecture hall, holding forth on his area of expertise, because he has none. No notice hangs on his office door saying, do not disturb doctor of philosophy at work, for he has neither office nor degree. Not a single publication bears his name, for there is nothing that he has written or edited. He sits on no committees, he receives no salary. He is, in short, not a member of the department. He is the very antithesis of an academic, a professor of nothing except ignorance, which he does profess, and in which he excels. So, to conclude, when we ask what is the relationship between philosophy and politics, are we asking about Socrates or about an academic discipline called philosophy? Or more to the point, when is academic philosophy political in the manner of Socrates, waking us up to the things that matter most, and when is it not? Thanks, Brian. I'm going to throw it open to other members of the panel if they would like to, to comment on, on some of that. So one I'd, yeah. I... I, I, I will I will take up uh, uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. That was very interesting, the relationship between uh, Socrates and, of course, it's a, it's a very... It's an elemental relationship. Uh, uh, and, and obviously it is very important to start with, uh, with this, with this um, contestation uh, in, in Socrates of the political and the contestation from the political onto Socrates' way of doing philosophy. And what I think was very uh, purposeful and very important in what you said is that you showed in some way how the philosophical and the political have a type of common denominator. Namely, namely uh, it is both of them, for different, uh, in different manners, according to different modalities, both of them put forth a possibility of being against death, yeah. of, being, of securing a type of against death. The political seeks to secure against death, and the philosophical, uh, even though Socrates says to, uh, to philosophize is to learn how to die with responsibility, it is his whole, uh, his whole uh, uh, dialogue in the, in the Phaedo marks how his life is, in fact, his philosophical life, that life that is <coughs> uh, uh, worthy of, of living, is a life uh, against death, against, against the, the <coughs> radical finitude of death. What I, what I want to uh, just mark, however, is that although the political and the philosophical share this same, uh, this same worry about being against death, they approach it very and radically differently. And I think where philosophy must be in some way dissociated from the political is that philosophy constantly and incessantly questions the violence of the political. Yeah? And the very uh, radical uh, uh, dialectic by which the political uh, um, uh, by which the political brings about violence and covers up this violence with ethical norms. Yeah. I, I take it this was the idea. This was the idea behind your your head when you when you said when you wanted to quote Fanon, Franz Fanon, yeah. Uh, and uh, and yeah. So so even though I don't believe, I think a philosopher must very radically and cons constantly question any attempt to dissociate the philosophical from the political, uh, one must maintain a type of, philosophically speaking, one must maintain a type of irreducibility in the modality by which philosophical questioning questions the dialectic of the political, this way of uh, propagate, propagating uh, violence. Yeah? Um, and I think we'll get back to this, uh, especially in the relationship with Judaism, with Nazism, where, where uh, um, a, a different uh, 
uh, a different manner of looking at the relationship between singularity and universality will be deployed uh, through, through, yes, through uh, Jewish thinking as in, in a sort of difference with, uh, with uh, philosophical, political, philosophical slash political thought. So, I, I, yeah, I think uh, the, the f- philosophy must constantly question any attempt to dissociate the, uh, it from the political, but at the same time maintain the irreducibility of philosophical questioning to the dialectic of the political. Uh, yes, thank you, Brian. Uh, it came to my mind uh, while you were talking uh, the curious fact that Anna Arendt, mm, uh, starting from the uh, conflict between philosophy and politics at the beginning of her career, of her mm-hmm. work, uh, she ends up Mm. Uh, so referring to Socrates implicitly as a resistant Mm -hmm. Mm. is a philosopher but at the same time there is something in the way of life mm, of Socrates and uh, at this point the important thing is to think about philosophy as a way of life, Mm -hmm. as a way of life that shapes, as a chosen way of life, that shapes subjectivity and the way in which you behave in your everyday life, but at the same time, this way of shaping differently your subjectivity can affect Politics. So there is a change of perspective, mm? uh, and I'm just using Arendt as, an, uh, as a pretest. So politics is always uh, thought of as something that has to be carried out by a collective subjectivity, let's say. Uh, we can we can think about this subjectivity in the different way, more um, compact or less compact, but it's a collective subjectivity. And what is quite, uh, um, let's say, challenging in this way of using Socrates is what you mentioned before, that he interpel one by one the singularities of citizenships. And so, uh, and this is the way in which also politics can be changed, not as a universal project, not by a universal subject, but change it our single subjectivity day by day. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very interesting because, for example, uh, the, the also Michel Foucault, mm, in the last courses, turned to ethics, uh, ethics, ethics as ethos, not as morality or a rule from which to deduce uh, behavior, but as ethos, so the way in which we uh, become subject and change ourselves as subject as a political action where ethics and politics are one and the same. No? And this, I think, it's a very uh, unusual way to think about politics from the perspective of philosophy. Um. But it's also, sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> because philosophy has always projected onto politics a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, table of uh, action to, to pursue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is a very different way of compenetrating ethics and philosophy. So the bios, the 
ethos, the single life. So let's say the revolution begins in shaping mm -hmm. myself. Well, um, I, I'd like to respond to both of those responses, both of which I welcome and find simpatico. Um, and I'll keep my remarks fairly brief because I've already had six or seven <laughs> minutes of this chunk of the evening's um, conversation. But I want to say that, um, to my ear, what you both said um, went to hang to, hangs together. Mm -hmm. So if I may start, Joseph, with what you said, and then, if I may, connect it with what you said, Simona, at least as I take it. Um, I fully take the point that there is... Um, a sense in which it becomes necessary to separate out what I have been putting together, mm -hmm. politics and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to say something that I didn't say in the five or six minutes that I had because it's impossible to say everything, which is how Socrates himself does that, yes. right? Yeah. Of course. Because when Socrates insists that as a philosopher he is playing, if you like, a political role, practicing the true art of politics, as he puts it in the Gorgias quote that I gave, he also says, as in the Apology, um, that it makes a point of saying that he doesn't go to the General Assembly and make speeches. Yes. He doesn't participate, in other words, in what you might call practical politics or policy making, as it would have been understood in the kind of democratic system that Athens had, where policies were decided at meetings of general meetings of all the citizens. And that difference is reflected in a distinction that he makes that is distinctly odd. It's a distinction between something like the self and, and the self's interests. And he makes this distinction mm -hmm. in the Apology. And what he is saying, as I understand him, is that his art of politics is practiced precisely on the self, which is why this brings me, Simona, to what you were saying. In other words, to use your language, his political craft is concerned with shaping subjectivity. It's concerned with who you are rather than what you have, is one way of putting it. That's simplistic, but nonetheless, it picks up, I think, this distinction, this rather odd distinction that he makes in his defense speech in the Apology between the self and its interests, a distinction that he makes, I think, systematically. In other words, it applies both at the level of the individual and at the level of the city or polis or state. So that his concern, as I understand it, as a philosopher, is political in this sense, that he wants to focus Athens on its neglect yes. of itself, its failure to shape its own subjectivity, mm. as regards the things that he says matter most. That's to say right and wrong, good and bad, justice, courage, the nature of love and beauty, and all those other topics that get discussed in Plato's dialogues. So I think that, so as I say, I, I take both your points, and I think you're mentioning Hannah Arendt is particularly, if I may say, apt, because Arendt's version of Socrates is very much the kind of Socrates that I've tried to present. Yes. And for her, Socrates is like the antithesis of the, quote, thoughtless person, the kind of person who, failing to mind what they do and to mind even who they are, ends up doing evil. And in that sense, Eichmann, who was, of course, the Nazi leader who oversaw the so-called final solution of the so-called Jewish question by a policy of mass extermination, Eichmann is, in a way, the absolute opposite of Socrates. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense in which, in her work, yes. those two figures are the pol polar opposites. Um, one being a kind of pure model, is her word, of a thinker, and Eichmann being the model of thoughtlessness, which is why she introduces the word banality, 
into her description of his evil. It's a phrase which I think has been greatly misunderstood, and she's been, I think, unjustly criticized. So there may be just criticisms as well to make. I accept that. <laughs> Especially because, I mean, she, she wrote what she wrote not knowing a lot of things that have come to light since yes, 1963. Right. Yeah. But, but at the time, based on what she knew, I think what she was trying to do was to emphasize precisely this, f- this failure, if you like, of, on the part of someone like Eichmann to, th- to, to, to be um, human in the sense in which, he's, in which Socrates says in the Apology that the unexamined life is simply not a human life. It's a form of, it's a, it's a form of life, but it's not what he, Socrates, would call a human life. So that's my response to I, w- I would just... Uh, just to, uh, very quick, very think, quickly. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, just, <clears throat> just to mark a, a, a very important point that we're, we're turning around, we're revolving around, mm-hmm. is that Socrates does not go to the assembly. Yeah? He does not go to the assembly, and, and you said it quite rightly, because in the assembly, what do we discuss? We discuss interest, exactly. the, the, interest the interest of the city, the interest. Which brings us to a point very important, that the ethical or the philosophical this transformation of subjectivity, because Foucault ends up with the idea, certainly, of work on the self, of paresia, the saying true, but it is in view of a radical transformation of subjectivity. It's not just uh, uh, an evolution or an individuation a la Nietzsche. It is a radical transformation, not only of subjectivity, but also of the social order. What is very interesting here is that the ethical has to be thought without interest, outside of interest, outside of the circumference or the uh, circumscription of interest, which brings us to the, to the question that perhaps the ethical beyond and above the political must always and necessarily be an ethics that uh, at least confronts the possibility of the without interest, to to be ethical without an interest, because to have an interest is necessarily to bring in this dialectic of violence, this dialectic of of violence that is covered up in ethical norms. So, uh, So I'm all for the relationship here between Socrates and Foucault, as long as we understand that what what we mean here by uh, by the elaboration and the, and the cultivation of subjectivity aims at a radical transformation beyond interest of what the subject is. Yeah. Uh, Very quickly. Yeah. No, but I, I can uh, catch it up in... After. Okay, well, so in, in that okay. case, let's, yeah. let's move on to the more sort of focused, sort of precise question, which is really the question of the evening, uh, the relationship between philosophy and, and Nazism in particular. Uh, one way of looking at this um, is that philosophy simply reflects certain currents in our, in our culture. Um, another way of looking at it is that philosophy, at least in its history, has encouraged or even kind of promoted uh, certain political um, thoughts, uh, Nazism, for example. Uh, Joseph, let's hand over to you. Perhaps you could tell us about that. Okay, so I, I suppose, I suppose what, what would be important before we get into the question of Nazism uh, and the relationship between philosophy and Nazism, it's a very heavy title, but before we get into that, maybe we... we, we, we backtrack a little bit. Yeah? It is true that, and let's focus on German philosophy, it is true that throughout German philosophy there is a persistent, uh, a persistent uh, thesis of anti-Judaism, yeah? a very radical thesis of anti-Judaism. What is anti-Judaism? Anti-Judaism is the fixation of a conceptual representation of Judaism as other as radically other to the development of identity, of sameness. It is the fixation of Judaism into a particularism, into a particularism. That is a fixed, determined categorization which is defined, and this is how, for example, Kant, but also Hegel, even though there are incredible differences between Kant and Hegel, but what is extremely uh, what is extremely interesting here is that Kant is 
proposes a type of anti-Judaism based on the heteronomy of the Jewish law, which is obviously opposed to the autonomy of the moral law, uh, as you can read in the uh, religion within the limits of simple reason. Uh, Judaism is casted out into what Kant calls a historical religion, which is, of course, not at all the religion of reason, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, the ethical religion, which stems from the autonomy of the moral law. The historical religion is that religion which is subjected completely to a heteronomic, unknown commandment that comes from above and crushes uh, the autonomy of the subject. Well, and eventually Kant, as you know, calls for the euthanasia of Judaism in the conflict of the faculties. And Hegel, Hegel, this is very, very interesting because Hegel develops his kind of, Juda of anti-Judaism and accuses Kant of being Jewish, yeah, of being a Jewish philosopher, as if Kant was not anti-Jewish enough, you know. And, which is, and of course, for Hegel, what w Judaism is typified, is categorized as this, uh, this religion that is not a religion. Why? Because it is grounded in radical separation yeah, or radical differentiation between this irrepresentable other God and the human. And and, uh, and and man, right? And so, so you have you have countless countless anti-Judaisms in in the history of philosophy. Kant, Hegel. You have a, a version of anti-Judaism in Nietzsche, of course. Obviously, in Heidegger, you have a, a type of radical anti-Judaism, and we'll 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 get to to this. So, anti-Judaism is to fix uh, Judaism into a particularism. Uh, defined as a dogmatic, heterogeneous law which is resolutely opposed to universality. Yeah? Which is resolutely opposed to universality. <coughs> Antisemitism is a very late concept, came in the 19th century. Antisemitism is racially grounded. Yeah? It's uh, a typification of, uh, a, a, of, of a people uh, based on, on uh, uh, racial uh, um, uh, attributes. Yeah? Now, Kant is anti-Judaic, Hegel is anti-Judaic, and I refer you here to the, uh, the spirit of Judaism, the Frankfurt writings, where these, these are very radical anti-Judaic texts. You know, Hegel says that the Jew is like, the Jewish figure is like a flea stuck in the mud. Yeah? So why is it a flea, the, the Jewish figure? It's a flea because the Jew does not have a place. Yeah. He's without place. He's a wanderer. You've heard this expression, the wandering Jew. So he's like a flea. He hops around without a fixed place. doesn't have a place. And he's stuck in the mud, this flea, because, according to Hegel, he can't elevate himself or herself. The Jewish figure can't elevate itself to <coughs> the reconciliation, to spirit. Yeah? It's stuck in the materiality of the world and cannot elevate itself to the idea of absolute knowledge. Heidegger, Heidegger confounds the two. Yeah. Heidegger brings the two together. Yeah? He brings a radical anti-Judaism and a radical anti-Semitism. Now, Heidegger's case is a very, very radical and very problematic case. Obviously, Heidegger is one of the uh, 20th century, if not one of the greatest philosophers that we have seen in our history. And yet... What is radical about Heidegger's anti-Judaism slash anti-Semitism is that he marks a radical foreclosure of Judaism. Whereas in Kant and Hegel, the Jewish figure could still convert out of Judaism, yeah, convert out of Judaism into the universality of reason or into spirit. There was a possibility of conversion. For Heidegger, there is a radical foreclosure. The, the, Jewish, the Jewish figure does not even exist. Yeah, does not even exist for Heidegger. For, for Heidegger, the Jewish figure does not have any relationship to being, yeah? has no relationship to being. And this is a, this is a very profound thesis uh, that, marks, that marks that Heidegger remains completely silent about Judaism because he doesn't need to speak about Judaism. They don't have a relationship to being. They're already foreclosed out of being. So you see, the, 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 the modality of this anti-Judaism is something quite 
quite old, quite ancient in the, in the history of philosophy. Now, I, I, believe that, I believe that what is, what is uh, what, why, why this anti-Judaism? That's the real question. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, this is our history and, 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 uh, and the history of philosophy, we constantly have to return to it also because of this anti-Judaism. We have to deploy how this anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism uh, uh, um, shows itself in, in, in our tradition. But I think one of the, one of the main, one of the main, uh, uh, one of the main reasons why uh, philosophy has so radically marked itself as anti-Judaic and as anti-Semitic is because Judaism seeks to think another relation to the universal. It is another relation to universality, perhaps even another type of universality, yeah? a universality which is not grounded and founded on the pretension of truth, yeah? but rather on the idea of justice. I think this is a radical divide between, on the one hand, philosophy, and on the other, uh, Judaism. I think philosophy is in, in inherently, and Heidegger showed us this with very radic uh, with with, uh, with great radicality. Philosophy is riveted to the truth of being, to the to the to, to the question of truth, whereas Judaism secondarizes the question of truth to privilege the question of justice. So I guess the question is here, is here, what is the relationship between truth and justice? Yeah? What is the relationship between uh, the horizon of truth, uh, between the horizon of truth either as universality of reason or reconciliation in, 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 uh, in, in Hegel or gathering into unity or community and the idea of an idea of justice which would require another source of meaning than that riveted to truth. Yeah. So that's how, that's how I would uh, characterize very quickly uh, the, the modality of this. Of this Thanks very much, Joseph. Uh, I want to open it up to some audience questions in a minute, but before that, I'd like to invite yes. our members of the panel to respond. Simona. So just uh, a, a, a very... Uh, so, thank you. Uh, I think that there is a, a, a persistence that uh, go through uh, anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, to be against the Jew as the subject of anarchy in the eti deep etymological meaning yeah. of the word, and arche, they don't have root, they don't have an origin. Mm? Yeah. And so they cannot be identified. Right. And this is passing through the uh, cultural anti-Judaism and the racist anti-Semitism, and they mixed up because it's very difficult to, to separate the two mm -hmm. uh, registers of discourse. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity, so the opportunity, the, the unlucky way to read a lot of uh, um, Nazi uh, anthropologists, mm -hmm. philosophical anthropologists, they call themselves like this, uh, and all the register, the cultural, the philosophical, the ethical, they mixed up. Mm -hmm. They are not only biologistic. Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, so, and this, I think, because it's a subject, it's an anarchic subject. Mm -hmm. And this, thank you for. And now, just a provocation yeah. toward your distinction between. Uh, the question of truth posed by philosophy and the question of justice uh, posed by uh, Judaism. Mm -hmm. And it came to my mind a name, Leo Strauss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Leo Strauss, uh, I think you know it, him better than, than me, but for him, the question of truth and the question of law and the question of justice are absolutely inseparable. Yes. So, yeah. and 
how do you answer to I, I would I would answer in the following sense. You're absolutely right to, to, to mark that for Leo Strauss, uh, uh, truth, justice, and law. Yeah? Uh, he also adds love, but truth, justice, Just law, love are, are inseparable, are yes. radically inseparable. But the question of <laughs> truth is... A, a Paramount. Yes. Yeah. Of course. But the fact that they're inseparable, yeah? the fact that they're interconnected is not at all... Uh, not at all a, a, um, a, a reason enough to not dissociate them within their inseparateness. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and I think, I think that, I think that uh, w what is, what is um, uh, uh, in order to think about this, this relationship between Judaism and philosophy, I think, we, we must we must have at least at least a, a an idea of how justice affects truth affects truth questions truth destabilizes truth and and at the same time at the same time where truth requires that destabilization that destabilization by justice so and, and this is the modality, the mm -hmm. undialectical modality by which, by which I would qualify this inseparatedness of mm -hmm. truth and justice. I believe that, obviously, philosophy has always taught justice. We started with Socrates and Plato. We've always taught justice. But the modality by which we've taught justice is a modality of reconciliation. I think the relationship between Judaism and philosophy, if it has any meaning... It, it must, there must be another type of relationship that occurs between justice and truth. And I believe that this relationship should be one where justice incessantly questions truth and truth almost lets itself be questioned by justice, lets itself be destabilized by, by justice without necessarily invoking the, the necessity of their being together, reconciled, where, whereby, true, whereby justice becomes justification, for example. Yeah? Uh, and I think this has a, a lot to do with the political, yeah? to mm -hmm. never... Uh, yeah, sure. to never uh, justice is other than justification. Yeah? Yes. And, and, and I think politically, this has a lot of weight, uh, today most particularly. Right. I'd like to <clears throat> thank you very much, Joseph, for your... Uh, for your presentation, which um, uh, there's, there's a lot to it, and it's impossible to do justice <laughs> to all of it in one go. So I'm going to focus, if I may, on the first part of what you were saying when you drew attention to the anti-Judaism yeah. that is present not only in Kant and in Hegel, mm -hmm. but I think you said you know it's a kind of feature of German philosophy, but it can also be found elsewhere. Yeah. And it's also an example of something larger, in my view, mm -hmm which goes to part of the question which I think was, um, Peter, that you framed, does our philosophical tradition simply reflect these currents in our culture, or has it contributed to them? Well, whether it's contributed to them, I think I want to dwell just for a minute on the fact that philosophy, A, has a tradition, which is part of what you were emphasizing, and B, that it does reflect currents in the culture. In other words, philosophy is not something that is hovering above the world, unconditioned by it. On the contrary, yes. it is very much a part of the world that it itself studies. And one of the occupational hazards, in my view, of philosophy and of philosoph being a philosopher mm -hmm. is the illusion yes. that you somehow are above the fray. I found what you said very helpful in reminding yes. us that philosophy is not mm. above the fray. And therefore, whatever answer there may be to the general question of the evening of the relationship between philosophy and politics, it doesn't consist in philosophy standing above and disciplining no. politics that is below. And in this respect, I would say that what philosophy needs, it was implicit in what I was saying in my five minutes when I couldn't develop this theme, but philosophy needs in a way, this might sound strange, to return to Socrates, to the Socratic moment of reminding someone of 
you talked about shaping subjectivity, of reminding you of who you are. So let me just, let me just flesh that out slightly before we move on to explain what I mean. In dialogue after dialogue, Socrates poses questions that take the form, what is X? We all know that, if only from 101, philosophy 101. What is justice? What is courage? What is virtue? But if you look more closely at the text, you find something which I think is significantly different. Certainly in the Mino, where virtue or arete, excellence, human excellence, is the topic, and also in the Euthyphro, where piety, it's a hard word to translate um, from the Greek, is the topic. What Socrates actually asks his interlocutor is not the question, what is virtue, but what do you say Mino, virtue is. Mm -hmm. And to Euthyphro, he says, what do you say piety is? And he's saying this to someone who is about to prosecute his own father for impiety. Yeah. Just as in the Mino, he asks the question to Mino, what do you say virtue or arete is, when Mino has claimed to be an expert on the subject. My point being that his questions appear to be directed outwards towards the nature of something like virtue or piety or the meaning of the concept. But there's a trajectory whereby the question returns like a boomerang mm. and is turned inward and the questioner, sorry, the questioned, the person who is being asked the question, is ultimately being asked to recognize themselves what it is that they say about these subjects and where that's coming from, thus opening up the possibility of the, the reshaping of subjectivity, the radical transformation, as you put it earlier, Joseph, of the self, yes. not just tinkering with particular thoughts or ideas, let alone interests. And so what I want to say is that philosophy itself, as a tradition or as a set of traditions, is called upon to do the same thing. And that one problem that I see with the way in which philosophy has developed as a tradition is that it has somehow lost the sound of that Socratic voice in its own ear. Yeah. Well, we've had a pretty dense discussion so far, so I want to open it up to some audience questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll make sure a microphone <laughs> comes to you. Uh, let's take just sort of two or three questions in succession, and I'll invite the panel to, to respond uh, to those that they oh, wish to answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lady in grey uh, here. Hey. Um, yeah, I think what I struggle with the most so far, what I struggle with the most um, of what you said is um, when you started to elaborate, you know, and you kind of had the chance to, to pick any any sort of direction in terms of philosophy in connection with politics, that I felt uh, that the topic chosen was very much religious. And I'm not saying that this is in any form, in my eyes, separate. I think it isn't at all. But I feel the whole, the whole discussion is, is very much based on that, and it hasn't really been pointed out enough, in my eyes, to really to really think about the, the whole justice and, you know, how, how do we say right or wrong, which for me, the way this, the, the, the discussion developed is, is really important to come back to where, where you started, you know, to say, well, he, he kind of, you know, denied the gods, you know, and this was the start of this trial. This was the whole, uh, you know, kind of start of everything. And I, I feel that this is, for me, something that is has to be looked into it that the our whole system of morality and and judgment is is not to be left out you know in 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 thinking about the the topic of the evening as well and um the the second part of what you said as well the the shaping of um subjectivity where i struggle because there is a lot of philosophy uh, out there which is fighting against that and, and wants to get away to think of us, you know, of, of some sort of identity, which I kind of sympathize with because the way of shaping yourself into something, whatever it is, always gives you a kind of, uh, you know, 
the danger of, of you know, being in a category and therefore being abused, manipulated and used and excluded or included. So I feel these two things are, yeah, quite... Maybe I would like to have your opinion on, on that. <laughs> okay. We'll go straight to our next uh, question and we'll, we'll respond as, as a group, if that's okay, just so I can fit everybody in. There's a gentleman uh, at the front here. Thank you very much. One thing that um, you just... Well, I mean... Um, Quite referred to, but I mean this anti-Semitism, which of course one says with Nazi, but I've got my own view that this was um, just one strand and it was obviously dominant in the Reich, uh, Reich, but the Jewish contribution and the philosophical contribution had been considerable and I think it was only in the Reich and of course the, the Victor powers were the Anglo-American liberal and the Marxist period in Russia and Jews of course have made a fundamental contribution to both. And in the Federal Republic, uh, the philosophical liberalism and the German Democratic Republic, Marxists, I mean, Jews were promoted again. So that, uh, the, the, I mean, that the, uh, the Reich was an aberrant approach. If you take the whole of German history, it's not the dominant approach. It's, it's those two periods, actually, of tremendous ideas and the Jews' phenomenal contribution that Jewish people made in the Weimar Republic the period you compare, it's a 30 years war where it wasn't German selling, but it was very opposite. The loss of life was phenomenal, and uh, Jews were then actually doing quite well. The court Jews and other people uh, who, and general uh, advisors to German states. So I just wonder if you just could comment on my view of the Reich and the anti Semitism of that Reich was an aberrant. Okay, thank you. And is there a third question? There's a lady right at the, almost at the back in the middle. Hello, I felt a niggle of worry in the early part of the discussion about the idea that there is such a thing as a life that is not wholly human, this distinction between there is a good, such a thing as a living life properly as a human being, but there's also, oh, I wrote a few things as it went as you were talking, there is a not wholly human life. There is such a thing as life, not living life as a human. And uh, <clears throat> doesn't this provide grounds for making different values on different people's lives? I find it quite worrying. Uh, I don't know if I got the words right there. Yeah, fantastic. So let's allow our panel to respond to some of those. So, so just, just to summarize, uh, if I can, uh, the first question was about the role of religion in understanding the relation between uh, philosophy and Nazism, whether religion perhaps ought to be emphasized more or perhaps has been emphasized too much. Um, the second question was about recent history, uh, recent German history. Um, and the third question was a worry about this idea of a, a not wholly human life. And uh, I suppose that's a question for you, uh, Brian. Well, OK, I'll start with that, but then I would like to also comment on the first question. Um, the, the worry that you express, I think, is a, is, a, is, is, a, is a legitimate worry in the sense that I think we should be very cautious about any discourse that appears to say that there's only one proper way of being human or of living a human life. And I understand how it could be that what I said came across that way, but it's not what I intended. And it's not what I think um, lies in Plato's text when Socrates talks about uh, the unexamined life and says that it's not... Uh, a, it's not a, a life for a human being. It's usually translated as uh, not a life worth living, yes. but it's much stronger than that in the Greek. It's, it's that it's not a human life, or it's not a life for a human being. Now, what I think needs to be emphasized here is that he's not talking about one lifestyle rather than another. It depends what one means by lifestyle, I suppose, but I'll, I'll, one needs a vocabulary here. He's not talking about, let's say, an Athenian way of life as opposed to a Spartan way of life. He's not talking about Greek as opposed to uh, Persian. And uh, he's not um, uh, suggesting uh, 
that people need to become philosophers in the way in which he is a philosopher in order to make their lives worthwhile. What he is suggesting, I think, is that any life that is worth calling human has to be thoughtful, reflective, self-aware. A life in which you examine what you are doing and what you are thinking so that you don't fall into some kind of mindless, uh, habitual um, behavior that is not your own. In a way, then, the point he's making is about, if you like, authenticity, the idea that your life should be authentically yours and not the property, as it were, of some hegemonic power that is outside of you without your even realizing it. So uh, there's so much more to be said about this, but I'm, what I'm s wanting to say is that his thought, I think, is on another plane in a way from the plane on which you are expressing a perfectly appropriate worry. And if it were heard that way, then it would... Sorry, go on. Yes. It's more that there is some sort of, I'm not, right. I find the word essence something I don't know enough about to use. With that kind of. Some sort of ideal, right. es essential it's quality one, rather than what yeah. everyone has in common. Now, to, You're absolutely right. That there has are, to be. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Oh, I can't, I can't find yeah. any more It makes sense. It's a kind of anti-essentialist sort of worry that, that yes. you're expressing yeah, and that you're attempting to meet. But, but in fact, what I'm trying to say is in sympathy with what you're saying because it seems to me that the whole thrust of Socratic inquiry is to break up what you could call a kind of essentialism in a way, although Plato is associated with... It's just, this gets to takes us too far away from the topic for tonight. But what I want to say in response to what you were saying about a right-wing discourse is this. This is precisely a way in which philosophy can contribute politically because what philosophy can offer is the sort of examined life that Socrates is talking about, the sort of critical analysis that takes words when they are used in the way in which you are describing, right, and critiques them. So that's how I want to respond to that. On the question of religion, just very briefly... This is, to some extent, I think, um, what comes of our reading a text from another era through the lens of our own. It's why when I read out that passage in which Socrates says that um, he has been appointed by the gods to be a kind of gadfly attached to the city, and when I referred to the first charge against him, um, or the second charge against him, which is that he doesn't acknowledge or rec recognize or respect the gods of the city. It's why I tried to emphasize that this needs to be heard politically, ra and I didn't say, but I could have said, rather than religiously, because this distinction between politics and religion is one which I think we are bringing with a kind of hindsight and superimposing upon a text and a culture in which that distinction either wasn't there or it certainly didn't run along these lines. My understanding of the charges brought against Socrates is that they are essentially political charges. He's accused of being an enemy of the people, and that's what it really amounts to. Now, the, the, the conventional way of understanding that second charge is that he's guilty of heresy, but I think that's a, an anachronistic reading, and that it's not really about religion in the sense in which we would talk about religion, namely a belief or a faith. It's about a failure on his part to observe certain practices which then put the city at risk because of the way in which the city articulated its own interests vis-à-vis -vis Athenia and vis-à-vis -vis -vis the gods in general. I just want to add one little thing. I don't know if, if uh, I'm marking uh, what, what, you were, what you were saying, but I, I want to say it any, anyhow. Um, it's about the relationship between Auschwitz and, and religion. Yeah? Because I think one of the most uh, grave dangers about a type of discussion like this, uh, and where there is the interest of a discussion like this, because there is a great danger to it, is that to transform Auschwitz into a sacralized event, 
uh, that would be uh, absolutely beyond all types of representation, you or of representation of historical uh, uh, comprehension. You have this, these debates in France. There was, there was a very big debate between Claude Landsman on one hand and the, the filmmaker of Shoah and uh, and um, Georges Didier Berman, who wrote a, a, a book called uh, Images uh, Despite All. So there, there's a great tendency uh, so, sometimes in continental philosophy to make Auschwitz a radical irrepresentable and to sacralize it into this type of event that cannot be comprehended. I think, I think to, to do this is to perform a type of... Uh, to, in, uh, to inscribe a type of religiosity in, uh, in philosophical questioning about Auschwitz that, uh, that really should be entirely re-examined. I think it's marking. I think it's marking. I think it's marking the same mistake that I was talking about. The same mistake that I was talking about uh, uh, in regards to anti-Judaism. I think it's making Auschwitz a particularism. Not a singularity, but a particularism. Singularity means the constant and incessant returning of this event, the, the manifestations that are incessantly returning from this event, and not at all its irrepresentability. Now, what kind of philosophy must confront this incessant return of Shoah or of Auschwitz in our present time, this is a question that, is, that seems to me to be uh, completely removed from any type of religious appropriation, religious reappropriation, theological or even teleological uh, reappropriation of this, of this historical event. So I just... You, when you ask about the question of religion, it got me thinking about this. I really think there's a danger about making Auschwitz an, uh, 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 an untouchable. No, Auschwitz is radically touchable, but, but the question is, uh, are, we making are, we, are, are we being just towards Auschwitz by only banking on explicating the truth of Auschwitz? That's how I would frame that question. Simona, I'm going to hand over to you, and in the yes. interest of time, I'd invite you to launch straight into the third yes, 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 uh, yes, question yes. for sure. this evening, uh, um, uh, which sure. is uh, how philosophical thinking <laughs> enables us to confront forms of evil so, that um, we've just been talking about and to reflect also on the historical aspects of, of evil. Yes, what I'm going to tell you is very uh, connected to what uh, Joseph just said. And uh, just to enter the argument, uh, Nazism uh, forced philosophy to circulate uh, very powerful expressions. Absolute evil, radical evil, diabolical evil, extreme evil, and these are only a few of the expression that the 20th century culture, not only philosophy, has mobilized to name what was happening and what happened uh, during the Nazi regime. So a lot of philosophers from the uh, before mentioned Strauss to Emmanuel Levinas, um, just to mention only the most uh, well known name. So, a whole generation of scholars, mostly uh, of Jewish origins, forged their thoughts uh, in the middle of war and exile. And of course, their perspectives different, uh, are different from one another, but they all share the same assumption that Auschwitz is the name that stands for the total coincidence of power and evil. Auschwitz is the name that stands for the accomplishment of nihilism. So, no wonder a generation that has found itself 
literally vis-à-vis -vis de rien, face-to-face eh, -face with nothing, could not be but haunted by nihilism and the question of nothingness. Yet I believe that their reading of the historical events molded uh, its lens, its tools, not only in the atrocity of the events, but also in a philosophical pre-comprehension, in a schema of interpretation of political evil that had long preceded the extermination camps. Elsewhere, I name this way of pre-comprehension of this schema of interpretation, Dostoevsky's paradigm. So I cannot go into it right now, but just let me say that this paradigm, as I see it, as I reconstructed it, draws out in a secular term, in secular terms, one main idea about evil that we can glimpse in Dostoevsky's masterpiece. And this is the idea. Evil results from the human will to break the boundaries of finitude and to mimic God's omnipotence. Since humans cannot create being out of nothingness, they pursue the destruction of being, bringing being back to nothingness. Mm? This is the schema. And this schema accommodates within itself and string together, for example, Nietzsche's idea of the will to power, Freud's discovery of the death drive, and Heidegger's vision of nihilism as a sort of destinal force. Although those ideas are often taken on and combined in a simple, simplistic, and one-sided way, so this constellation of ideas acquired a strong, a very strong theoretical pull, uh, consciously, consciously and sometime, sometimes unconsciously. And from this perspective, evil at the end is always understood as the greatest act of transgression. Out of the will to infinite power, out of an abysmal desire for unlimited freedom, that turns into rage and hatred for being and creation, and that therefore devastates and destroys. Now, this understanding of evil, of this schema, goes hand in hand with a specific view about power a specific view of power stuck on the image of a face-off between the individual and the locus of power, be it the state or a total domination. And this stark opposition shows its extreme malignant phenomenology in the relationship between perpetrator and victim. So the political evil par excellence is then represented in the following scene. On the one hand stands an omnipotent subject, ultimately the bearer of death, and on the other hand stands a subject, an impotent subject, reduced to a mere object because it has no recourse against that uh, strength, that violence. And this same polarity, this same view, uh, extends to the collective dimension, a scenic leader or a scenic party on one side, and the weak masses utterly incapable of resistance on the other side. 
So I think that this way of thinking is likely to stiffen our understanding of reality into a simple dualistic vision that is focused exclusively on the transgressive side, mm? on the transgressive face of a self, be it individual or collective, that is hungry for destruction and driven by the will to power. Inevitably, this dualistic schema obscures the complex phenomenology of domination and the multiplicity of subjectivities that inhabit that scene of evil. And I think that today, more than ever, philosophy should take on a more complex vision of political power and political evil, questioning the representation of a simple frontal relation between a subject that monopolizes all the power and, and, total, and a totally impotent subject reduced to an object. Of course, the perpetrator, the perpetrator victim relationship is a scene of evil. I'm not, of course, negating this. Nevertheless, it is, so to say, this scene, the arrival station of a long, complicated chain of action and reactions carried out by multiple actors with different shades of responsibilities. This was obvious for social and historical sciences. And so now philosophy itself has to recognize this and spell it out in its own terms and categories. A change of perspective is required and I think that it, it can draw a significant boost from linking together some of the most unsettling insights by Anna Rent, Michel Foucault, and Primo Levi. Mm? If we make the Arendtian idea about the banality of evil interact mm -hmm. with the Foucaultian notion of power and biopower, as well as with Primo Levi's reflection on the gray area, another set of concepts emerges. A different paradigm, we could say, that help us to interrogate political evil from the perspective of normality, not only from the perspective of transgression, from the perspective of the desire of maximizing life, and not only from the desire for death and destruction. <coughs> and this different paradigm implies also focusing less on the guilt of transgression and more on the guilt, let's say, the devious of the devious, and devious appears to me, the devious normativity of compliance, celebrated by a morality that sees critical judgment as a sign of pride. Mm? The shadow of that original sin committed by our first parents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simona. Now, there are nine minutes left, and we would like to Voila. get our <laughs> panel to contribute, or sort of respond to some of that, and take some audience questions. So I'm going to give four minutes to our panel and five minutes to the audience, because you'll have to answer the questions during that five minutes. So really, you'll get sort of more here. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, yes. I'm just going to Joseph. rebound on what, what you, I think it was very interesting, this idea of, of developing a, a new paradigm. but. What I found extremely uh, um, uh, 
uh, just in your in your appraisal is this idea of nihilism. I think I think that uh, uh, we we are we, we must confront this idea of nihilism with with its mo uh, speak directly oh, into the mic. We we have to we have to confront this idea of nihilism uh, uh, with with the most radical f force and n nihilism nihilism here uh, is is uh, is. Uh, uh, can be at least understood as uh, the the uh, the consent uh, the consent that we all uh, that we all um, uh, uh, agree on is this consent to to murder yeah this consent of of of, of murdering and this consent to violence perhaps this is where I understand the development of this new paradigm as an a type of ethics of singularity. In Paris, I, I, I work with a, a philosopher colleague of mine, uh, Raphael Zaguri Orly, and we, we work precisely on trying to develop this ethics of singularity focused on, on the idea of justice to counter this nihilism as consent to murder, as consent to violence. Which is which is uh, which is precisely the the uh, the the, the the, the the fabric of the political today. Yeah? The political today uh, um, is 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 um, is a type of of movement by which we consent to not see violences that are going on uh, in the name of ethical what you are calling uh, 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 critical judgments. Yeah, Ethic, ethical norms are, are cloaking. Uh, uh, incredible manifestations of violence and we consent to it perhaps philosophy must be perhaps philosophy must be the the the, the necessity to resist that consentment uh, <coughs> very briefly Simona I found that really also very um, very stimulating and we can't discuss it all but I was struck by a phrase you used towards the end was it deviant Com normativity of compliance or deviant compliance with normativity? One of the two. No, 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 no. Right. Um, I think this goes to, in a way, the heart of what um, this evening is about. Because as much as we have at times referred to periods before our own, ultimately, it seems to me, our concern has to be with what is happening now in our own day and age. And as a matter of fact, that is how I understand the idea of waking up that you find with Socrates. It's waking up to the present. It's waking up to what is happening now and becoming aware of the ways in which you might be compliant with something that is unjust um, without even knowing it because you're sleepwalking through, through life. And I think this has a particular application today with the rise of the far right, with their use of a certain kind of vocabulary that seems familiar. In a way, this picks up a, for a question that was asked earlier. A vocabulary that might seem familiar and which easily we could go along with and without even noticing, become compliant with something that becomes violence, um, the othering of certain groups, which today especially means uh, people who um, um, who identify as Muslim, but not only them. There's also the whole sort of range of people who are seen as other in term, relation to ourselves. And there are forces, I think, at the moment in the world which are tending to, to, to polarize the us from the them. Now, the, the, the dynamics of that is something that can be studied by various other sciences, but what philosophy can contribute is a certain kind of alertness to the way these words are functioning, words that are, as I say, familiar, like, for example, when you hear talk about our values, British values, how is the word British exactly functioning when it is attached to the word values and then used in a certain sort of political discourse? This isn't just about policy. Mm -hmm. This is about uh, how these words hang together and what we make of them. And if end philosophy has anything to contribute, I think, along with the kind of reconfiguration that Simona was talking about, it's also paying attention to the way in which 
words that are a familiar, ordinary part of our political vocabulary can be bent in a certain direction without our even noticing it so that we go along with certain um, uh, developments that become violent over time without even realizing that it has happened. Right. Now, Simona, you should... By rights, have the right of, to reply, but uh, we all also want to go to dinner <laughs> and finish yes. at eight, and I'm sure others have I got can plans. Also. So, <laughs> <laughs> now just uh, two words. Yep. So uh, I I like and I buy your new definition of nihilism, mm. uh, just because it's really under the gra- uh, against the grain because uh, nihilism has been always opposed to uh, the normativity mm-hmm. of values mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. but it's true uh, uh, the, the the normativity of value that can can lead to toothlessness right. sorry for the sure. pronunciation can brings about nihilism of course mm-hmm. yeah. and so that's that uh, brings me to the other question. So, what is philosophy at the end huh, as a very uh, daily practice? Yeah. Is to question the obvious. And to question the obvious is to question the obvious meaning of words. Huh? And so, that's an example. What was nihilism? Nihilism was to be remember all the, the, the definition that the history of philosophy gave about nihilism. Nihilism is to, to kill God. No? One of the uh, simplest uh, definition of nihilism. So let's wait. Let's try to be like Socrates and ask ourselves is it really nihilistic not to follow uh, a table of values that we already have here that somebody else in the name of a universality but actually in a particular place and in a particular way elevated to a universal norm. So I (laughs) I stop here. (laughs) Thank you. I think we've got... I think we've got time to squeeze in just one audience question. There was a lady at the front. Thank you to all of you guys. Um, I have a ton of questions, but I'm just going to limit it to one right now. Um, And I wondered, when you were speaking about uh, the tradition in German philosophy of being anti-Judaism, I wondered where Walter Benjamin fit into this discussion as a German philosopher who was also Jewish and who was writing while the Nazis were coming to power. And then in his text of divine violence, where he writes a critique of violence and he talks about his concept of divine violence, how questioning the obvious became a question about the relationship of law and violence. So then how does that fit into the relationship of philosophy and violence, and philosophy and Nazism? Yeah, uh, it's a a very massive question. And of course, (laughs) Jacques Jacques Derrida wrote a very important text uh, on on, uh, on the critique d'Argaval, the, 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 the critique of violence of, uh, of uh, Benjamin. But to, to answer very quickly, what I think was uh, uh, absolutely <coughs> radical in, uh, in Benjamin is that he, he uh, in his writing, uh, developed a fourth dimension of temporality which is radically Judaic. It is the messianic temporality. You know? It is not the uh, temporality of recognition. It is not the, t- the temporality of experience. It is not the, uh, the, the temporality of judgment, but it's the messianic temporality, that temporality that, that of that event that comes and ruptures time itself. That is a radically <coughs> Judaic uh, uh, idea that Benjamin works in his, uh, his critique of violence, right? Uh, now, it doesn't mean that this messianic event is not violent. It is for Benjamin. It is. It requires a type of violence, but it is also a violence that that breaks apart with the economic, normal uh, uh, banality of of being. Yeah? So here is his idea of justice. That <clears throat> here is where I would see his idea of justice as parting from an idea of truth. Yeah? That is, 
uh, from a, a, a classical philosophical idea of truth. I would see this uh, messianic temporality in Benjamin as an idea of justice which proliferates what was very important for Benjamin, the passages, the multiplicity of passages, the multiplicity of singularities, and not only the long philosophical quest for gathering or for unification. So where does he fit in? He's an oddball in German, in German philosophy, Walter Benjamin. Franz Rosenzweig also was an oddball uh, in, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, in German philosophy. Uh, and, and, but they were, they were oddballs because, uh, th because the, 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 source of their, uh, the source of meaning for them was other than philosophical universality, was other than uh, rationality conceived either as uh, as synthesis or gathering or unification. And I'm afraid we will have to finish there. Thank you very much to our panel and to our audience. <laughs>